Hey everybody, welcome to Victims and Villains Podcast. We are your Marvel correspondents. I'm Alan. I'm Josh. And today we're talking about uh, the latest entry into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, not yep. Andor. We just not spent Andor. like five minutes talking about Andor and my mic was muted. So this is take mm-hmm. two of this because um, I could spend the next hour talking about this week's Andor alone. We could, we could, we so, could sure. But we are not the Star Wars correspondents. We are the Marvel correspondents. So you know, I mean, we kind we kind of are. We, we we ended up doing a lot of the Marvel or the Star Wars stuff for victims this year too. So yeah, mm-hmm. True. um, but we're, today's focus is Black Panther: Wakanda Forever. Uh, just released into the theaters this weekend. Uh, we're going to talk about it spoiler free at first, and then get into spoilers. So. Uh, Josh, do you want to start us off? What What are your overall opinions of Wakanda Forever? Uh, well, I mean, highly anticipated film. Uh, I know a lot of people were um, looking forward to this, um, both out of, um, both out of enjoyment for the 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 character of Black Panther and the franchise, uh, but also out of curiosity to see how they were going to pull this off. Um. You know, I I honestly can't imagine that kind of obstacle, um, and it's just not something you would think about. You know, we've had three Iron Man films, we've had four Thor films, we've had several Captain America films and, and Spider Man films. You just you I I can't imagine any of those characters facing this obstacle, you know, on their second film. And so mm-hmm. I went into this film very anxious. I'm very excited. I'd seen the first trailer, and that was it. I have not had not seen any of the TV spots or clips that were dropped. I tried to go in as cold as possible, and I still hold Black Panther, the first one, up really high in the MCU. I think that was a great film, an absolute great film. Kind of Forever, I believe, is a good film. Don't believe it's a bad film. I don't believe it's one of the lower films in the MCU uh, ranking. I just don't think it was a great film. Um, You know, I was ready to give a a X amount of forgiveness uh, to the plot and everything based on the things they had to do. Ryan Coogler had the script for this uh, movie done before the death of Chadwick Boseman. Mm -hmm. And so him having to go back to that script and rework it um, I can't imagine uh, the pressure for that. So I had a level of forgiveness for plot, um, but there were just some technical things in the film and some plot things that I believe took it down a notch to good from great. But uh, outside of that, I, I still enjoyed it overall. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, I Like you, I, I wasn't sure what to expect with this, with the obstacles the film faced in pre-production uh, with Chadwick's passing. But I think they did a really good job of paying tribute to Chadwick Boseman and the and his character respectfully. Um, there's not much like Ryan Coogler's opinion on it, like pretty much convinced me to like. I was a little bit in the camp of recast T'Challa. But when I heard him talk about, well, this is something like if we went into this and recast T'Challa and everyone knows like this is why it takes you out of the movie, like then you're comparing somebody else's performance to Chadwick's and like, you know what really happened. So why not take those events and address them in the film? And I think the film does a really good job of that. Um, Overall, like it felt long to me, but I think out of the the Marvel films we've gotten this year, this was the like plot wise, this was the most solid because it felt like they stuck to the screenplay. It didn't just start riffing on things for scenes after scenes uh, like Thor did. And it felt like the most co- cohesive story that we've gotten from Marvel on the big screen in a while. Um, yeah, but it did kind of feel like, you know, everybody was saying this is the end of phase four. And uh, it did feel like a phase four film in that it didn't feel like it was, you know, propping us up for the next phase. It just felt like the rest of phase four and that for the most part, it was a contained story um, and uh, kind of in its own in its own bubble. 
uh, I was telling Seth last night, you know, when a, when the comics have a big crossover event, then they all kind of take a break and go back to their own little stories before yeah. setting up the next big thing. And that's kind of what Phase 4 overall, including this film, felt like to me. And I think a lot of Phase 4 has also been passing the torch. Uh, if you sure. look at, like, Sam Wilson or Hawkeye passing, passing uh, the, the bow and arrow to Kate Bishop. A lot of the yeah. this phase has been setting up like pa- the passing of the torch to the next next heroes, and I think this one gets to the heart of that too. Um, with uh, with addressing T'Challa's passing and what comes next for the nation of Wakanda and his family and mm-hmm. all those around him, I think they do a really good job of that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that getting into spoilers. Um, technically I was impressed with most of the film. Um, there wasn't really anything CG wise that, that disappointed me. Uh, I think they did a really good job with the underwater stuff. I think the avatar trailer I saw before this looks a little bit better, which, um, yeah, I would say that I we were talking about this, you know, a month or two ago about how it's kind of crazy that Disney is releasing two blue underwater people films within a month of each other and wondering how James Cameron was going to accept that. And I don't know if you went and saw the re-release of Avatar, but I, I went to see the re-release uh, with some friends. And at the end of it, they showed a clip of avatar 2 underwater and a lot of that has been put out in the recent trailer and it looks amazing Mm -hmm. and the underwater people um the the tribe that exists underwater it just looks so natural and i will say this while it was a cool uh, we'll get into spoilers but while it was a cool you know underwater civilization anytime they actually showed people underwater they all looked like they were holding their breath I think it's because they actually filmed some of this stuff underwater, whereas in Avatar, they look like they're existing underwater, not holding their breath for camera. Kind of like when you see those fake mermaid setups where the mermaid, you know, has the air and then puts it away and then smiles and interacts across the glass. That's kind of what this felt like. And I was I did notice that I'm like, you don't you don't look like you live underwater. You look like you're holding your breath. But I thought technical thing, you know. Yeah. And I thought uh Namor, Namor, uh, however you want to say it, because they keep changing it in the movie. Uh, I thought he was a decent villain, um, but not really a villain. Like it was very, we'll get into the spoilers. I, I enjoyed his character. I thought what they did with him and establishing his backstory was phenomenal. Um, like Killmonger, you, you saw the reasoning behind him. Um, to a point, and and you could like not sympathize for him, but be like, okay, I, you could understand him to a point, and and I I don't think it was as blatant as just copying Killmonger, but putting him underwater, yeah. but it was kind of similar themed, and like you could understand where he's coming from up to a point in the film. Hmm. Um, I will say uh, this was the second worst cinematic experience I've had in the theaters this year. Gosh, you've been um, having some goodness. Yeah, I don't know. So more crickets. I need no. I need to ask you this question: Do you think this movie is appropriate for a six-month-old? I don't think any film's appropriate for a six-month-old. Yeah, the people b- beside us brought an infant into the theater who decided to cry at every like intimate moment, any any like emotional beat. The baby decided to cry. And I so, I so you're saying the baby was very mature for its age and felt the emotional beat of the film, which made it cry. Is that at, what you're saying? No, I, I think at one oh, point okay. when they when they show the birth of Namor, like show his origin story, I, I leaned uh, over to my wife and the, the baby was crying. I was like, he's he's getting flashbacks to two months ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, good, but yeah. So don't don't like. PSA, don't take your babies to the movies. Especially, I, I paid for the ScreenX thing. thing so, a f- premium format ticket. Mm-hmm. I don't expect you to take a baby to that because it costs a little bit more. Like it, I can't it was imagine just, it's good on the ears of a, of a newborn either. I can't. No, it wasn't. 
Uh, like as yeah. soon as as soon as the trailer started playing, it start the baby started crying. I'm like, yeah, it's loud. It's a Marvel yeah. thing. Oh like, shit! Yeah. Hmm, um, interesting. All right. Well, shout out to you folks who brought your baby. Yeah. Trying not to do that. Thank you. Don't I, do I, that I, again. I, I understand the struggle of of parents with newborns, but come on now. Yeah. Uh, I, I think they, they knew that I was upset because I t- kept giving them a, like a glare throughout the movie. Um, mm. but other than that, like the screen X experience was fine. I think of the three Marvel movies I've seen this year in screen X, this one was the, it wasn't as worth it as there weren't, there, I can't think of any moment in this that was like, this is phenomenal in screen X. Uh, Because Thor Love and Thunder had the sequence with um, gore on that moon in black and white, which was really cool. And then Multiverse of Madness had the moments with Professor X and the White Void that were really cool. This one didn't really have anything that made me go, oh, uh, wow, that was awesome. The action scenes were were fun in it, but overall Mm -hmm. it was like, I saw it on screen X, got a free poster. There you go. That That made it worth it, so. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. my free poster I see that I see that up there yeah because I don't have enough movie posters already I know, uh, I know. but do we want to get into spoilers um we want to give our rating before we do spoilers yeah we can uh what what's your rating for Black Panther Wakanda forever are we doing out of five yeah I would give it I would give it 3.5 out of 5. I, I enjoyed it. at had a good time. I will see it again, uh, probably in theaters. You know, I, I always go to the movie with Maddie, and then I uh, usually take a friend or my mom or something for a second viewing. For example, when we saw Thor, I really did not want to go to a second viewing. I, I just... I really did not want to go, but I'd already bought tickets and promised to, you know my mom that I would take her this film. I do really want to see it again. I had a crazy busy weekend, so I couldn't see it again this weekend, but I do believe it's a good film. And, uh, and yeah, I I think a 3.5 is fair for me. I think I'm going to go a little bit higher. I'm going to, I'm going to go four. there. This movie had a, had a lot going against it. And I think it persevered and, came out strong on the other end i think it does some things that marvel movies like it broke the formula a little bit like you're expecting one thing like and we'll get into this in spoilers but i think there there's a lot here story wise and character wise that um i really enjoyed so this i think this is my favorite marvel movie that came out this year um, because I, I would I, say that I would say that too. I don't think that's a high bar. Yeah, it's it's not. Um, <clears throat> I because I, I I'd be quicker to go see this one again in theaters than I was for Thor or Doctor Strange. Um, yeah. Part of that's because of the baby. The other part <laughs> of it is because I think this is an enjoyable film. Um, and I would, I kind of want to see this in 3d with the underwater stuff because it's, it doesn't it, like maybe the screen X took away from that for me because of the way they project it. Like, I would like to see this in a 3d theater and see what the underwater stuff looks like. I almost saw this in 40 X with the moving chairs and the, the spraying water, but didn't, that didn't work out. So if maybe if I see it again, I might, I might go that route, but I think the movie Overall, I really enjoyed, and I'm going to give it a four. Okay. All right. So Sounds good. On that note, let's get into spoilers. Um, so this is your spoiler warning. If you've not seen Black Panther Wakanda forever, <clears throat> uh, we are going to spoil it for you. So I was kind of surprised they dealt with T'Challa's death before the opening crawl, before the opening Marvel Studios uh, <clears throat> montage. Um, but 
that was a really emotion. Like I, I knew that the the first act of this is going to get me emotionally, which is not something I can say for a lot of Marvel things. Mm-hmm. Outside of maybe Endgame, because mm-hmm. with that you're still dealing with the aftermath of Infinity War, mm-hmm. and that like that scene with Tony yelling at Captain America. Um, but this one was really gut wrenching. Like with Sh- Shuri, like scrambling to try to save her brother and like not being able to get there on time. what did you think of the opening? I, I thought it was effective. Um, Disney has learned their lesson to not use CGI models of, of um, actors that have passed uh, in films. So we do not see any, we don't, we don't even see a blurred body in the background. We see nothing. And, and I did wonder, okay, is he going to die from some battle off screen? Is he going to have injuries from in game that we didn't know about? What's it going to be? Um, and it ends up being a, a vague mirror of reality that he had an illness that he uh, kind of kept to himself and waited to tell his sister. And then his sister was struggling at the last minute to try to recreate the, uh, what is it? Heart, uh, heart shaped herb. Heart- heart-shaped herb she was trying to recreate it in, in an effort to save him and um it was abrupt it was um yeah just coming off that black screen i was like oh snap we're into it here we go uh and i thought it was really effective um and then we go right into the funeral um like we've seen in the trailers um so uh, uh, that all that um paired with the uh, uh no sound all Chadwick version of the Marvel Studios logo. I thought all of that was very effective. Very, very effective. Yeah, I... Oh. They had released that all Chadwick version before, and I should have expected it in this, but I wasn't. The one, th- the one thing that I was kind of surprised by was they didn't include his work in What If in that Uh which I get, oh, like right. it's a di- it's a different yeah. version of the character, but I was like, it would have been cool to see, like, cause, like that that was such a fun version of T'Challa that we I would have loved to seen them explore in yeah. a different reality, but, um, yeah, I think I don't even know where I was going. Um, <laughs> yeah, I th- I think they did a really good job of addressing his death. I know there's been some criticism online about from a certain uh, Marvel critic who shall not be named about them taking it directly from real life and putting it in the script and using his death to further along the plot of this movie. And I'm like, yeah, but what else? There's not much else you can do like that. I would argue against that. I, I would, I don't think they did do it to further along the plot of this movie because after the funeral, it cuts to a year later. And this is what I was talking about with Kugler already having this script and having mm-hmm. to rework it. I do feel like they could have worked in his death a little more than they did. Because honestly, this feels like a movie that is bookended by Chadwick Boseman's death. They talk about it in the beginning, then they kind of move on and do this movie, and then they talk about it at the end. And it feels like plot points in the movie probably didn't need to happen because of the death of Chadwick Boseman. Yeah. But I feel like they were in there in the original script and they kept him in there. And I was asking why, why did this need to happen when we already had, I'll just say it. Why did Angela Bassett need to die when we already had the uh, Chadwick Boseman's death? Like we, we could have used that as the catalyst for all of Shuri's emotions, did we really need another death in the movie? It felt less impactful to me. It it reminded me a lot. It it reminded me a lot of Thor, the dark world because the, the queen mother never makes it past the second film. uh, Mm. Cause Rene Russo did not make it past uh, Thor, the dark world. Uh, So I kind of, I kind of expected that. So that's like one instance of Marvel like following their their formula a bit. Um, and a, a lot of Marvel movies are guilty of following the formula of the first film. 
And Mm -hmm. there's a, there's a big moment in here that breaks that mold. And I was, I was surprised by it. And it's when Shuri eventually takes the black, the, the, the heart shaped herb to become the black Panther. And when she's in this, the, um, what's the name of their, Oh, I, um, I'm blanking on it. Uh, the sacred place or the celestial plane or C- celestial plane. I think. Yeah. Is that it? When Maybe. she's there, I, I expected them to follow the, the formula of the first film where T'Challa went and saw his father I was expecting her to go. Oh yeah, and, I was. And, I would see her mother. Yeah, or Chadwick blurred in the background. I yeah. was like, which one is it going to be? Yeah. And instead, it was Killmonger, and I'm like, wait, what? Like, oh, that's the best part of the film. Yeah. Yeah, and th- I was really caught off guard by that, and I think it did a good job of getting the audience up to speed on where Shuri was emotionally, because up to that point, I didn't really see her. Like there's that moment with her and her mother by the fire when they're trying to do the the ceremony to say goodbye officially yes. to T'Challa. Anyway, she's like, I just want to burn the world down around me. And there wasn't much of that throughout the rest of the film. Like a lot of it was her no. trying to bargain with Namor, and then when her mother dies, that comes back a little bit. But it was it was so lopsided for a bit until that Killmonger scene when it comes back to the foreground. And I was like, okay, so this is where she's at. This is where her mind, state of mind is. And I was kind of worried about what was going to happen after that. Like, I wasn't sure if they were going to have to like strip her of the power of the black Panther because she was going to go bad. Like, I honestly wasn't sure where they were going to go with this. Cause that's definitely mm-hmm. something they could have done. Yeah. I think, um, as much as I don't care for the off-screen antics of uh, Letitia Wright, I feel like Shuri um, kind of got the short end of the stick in this film because uh, when that happened, I was both amazed and then saddened that we didn't have more of the film focusing on this inner turmoil. We, we Not only do we jump ahead a year and we don't really see even like a montage of her and and how she's how she's living with herself for that year but then instead of focusing on her and her strife and her uh inner conflicts we have to endure a brand new character uh that they shove onto the screen and force feed i felt like it was something like they had lost chadwick boseman and T'Challa and Black Panther. So Shuri takes that role. But then someone was like, well, if we take Shuri into that role, then we need a new young tech girl to fill that role. So they shove uh, Ironheart uh, onto the screen. And while I enjoyed the actress and I am looking forward to her show, I feel like they could have cut her completely from this film. The film itself would have been fine and we would have had more time to focus on Shuri and her inner turmoil. I, 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 I really enjoyed Riri, Riri Williams in this. Uh, I, I too, I'm looking forward to her show. It felt weird that for the first half of the movie, she was the MacGuffin. Yeah. Like she yeah. was what Namor was after. She was the bargaining chip. Like it, that felt weird to me. And I, I too would like to like to have seen more of, Shuri's emotional journey through this film and part of me run- wonders if the off-screen antics of Letitia Wright had a had something to do with that because I know there were many delays in filming this uh, mm. for one reason or another around her schedule like I think at one point she was uh, stuck in the UK and couldn't get back to the states for filming because of covid protocols Mm. um so i wonder if there was just stuff that had to that uh had to be cut because of that um but yeah maybe maybe that's the case in terms of her scenes but in terms of why they brought riri williams into it it felt like that was to fill a void after 
Bo Bozeman's death and also to give a reason to film stuff outside of Wakanda. Like, we have mm -hmm. to have a reason why Ross is in this film. Yeah. And, and while he, I did like him in the first Black Panther, his his whole role in this film was like, um, you're just you're just like forcing a reason to put him on screen than having it be essential to the film. And I did have somebody say uh, online, like, well, if we didn't have Riri in the film, we wouldn't have had this machine, and the whole the whole film would have fallen apart without that. And my uh, my retort was. You're talking about a world where Shield had an invisible helicarrier, had multiple invisible helicarriers. Not only that, but they had Captain America's Shield in their possession for decades. You're telling me that we really needed to create a whole backstory for a character to create that machine? It wouldn't have just been acceptable that some power within the world had created a machine to detect it. Like I don't, I don't think it was. I, I feel like they just they really wanted to give us that character to fill some time and it took away from some of the character development that we could have gotten from the ones we came to see, honestly. Yeah, I, I really wish there was more Nakia in this film. Uh, look, I, I, I um, really like Lopita Nyong'o. I think the film does a good job of explaining why she wasn't in uh, Infinity War or Endgame. Mm -hmm. um, which we'll, we can talk about. And later. when she is on screen, she's great. She's, yeah. she has a badass scene. She's great. Like, I, yeah, she she nails every scene she's in, and I'm, I was happy for what we got at least. I I was kind of hoping that she was going to become the Black Panther, uh, <clears throat> but I completely accept Shuri as the new Black pa Panther. I think her her um. Mm entrance her first entrance as the black panther i think was phenomenal and gave me chills uh, i think they, they handled yeah. that very well with her entering the the cave with all of the 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 elder council and umbaku um mm. i i thought that was a very well shot scene yeah she looks great uh in in that uh, the, her redesign looked fantastic i just wish we got a little more of her, especially after that Killmonger thing, uh, because she sees Killmonger and he's like, it's because we share the same things. We want to see this world burn. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so intriguing. I was not expecting this turn. And then when she does show up as Black Panther, she's like, we're going to, we're going after them. We're taking the war to them. They, you know, killed my mother and disrespected Wakanda, uh, you know, get ready. And even M'Baku, who was like, Normally, the person who'd be like, hell yeah, he was, he was just, uh, even he was like, um, is this the right way to go? And he was, he kind of was like Uncle M'Baku, you know, like yeah. being her big guy with the advice and the listening ear. And I liked that dynamic. And I, and then they were right into the third act battle sequence. And I was like, oh, I kind of wish we want, we would have a little more of this back and forth. Like, is she good? Is she bad? Is she, you know, I mean, she's not bad, but is she overwhelmed? You know, uh, and then there was uh, there was almost a word for word quote from Civil War with uh, vengeance uh, consuming her and everything like that. And I wanted yeah. a little bit more of that. It was so compelling that I did want. And, and I was like, this is the I'll admit this is a good way to take Shuri the character. And I really did like that. And then once that happened, I was like, OK, so. Where are we going from here? Is she going to pass now that she recreated the 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 herb? Is she going to pass this off to somebody because she doesn't feel like she should have it or something? And then the theories of yeah, who's it going to go to? I was hoping it would go to Okoye because she uh, has a roller coaster of her character in this film, but unfortunately they give her a different suit, and uh, that's a whole another thing to talk about. Yeah, uh, the the Power Ranger suit, pretty much. <laughs> What, well, what? well, if that's the power, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think, uh, Ironheart's suit was more Power Ranger, Super Sentai, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then, yeah, and then Okoye's suit was like a little, a little bit different than that, but they both looked like, I was like, how many people need suits, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. And, and, and how, how often are they going to use that Iron Man camera work in all of these films, you know? It's, it's like we've got I mean, so many people with that it, angle now. It's almost like 
they they wrapped Endgame and they had the the setup for that off the side. And like, Kevin Feige is like, hey guys, uh, let's use that a little bit more. Use um, that more, yeah. <laughs> what annoyed me about all these suits, besides how horrible they looked, was that in the last third of this film, every two seconds, one of them was coming on screen. The face shield would disintegrate. They'd say a line, and then it'd come back up. And then they'd do another person. She'd come on. Face would disintegrate. She'd say her line, and it'd go back up. And I'm like, Black Panther said a lot of his lines behind the mask. Spider-Man, Iron Man. You don't need to disintegrate every time yeah. you want to speak. And it was kind of getting annoying. Like I was like, I thought you guys had uh, issues with your uh, with your special effects team. Why are you making them work like this? Like, Just talk yeah. behind the mask. Yeah, and I, and I, like CG wise, I think that the suits looked fine. Like I, the Ironheart yeah. suit looked cool to me. Like I can see the Super Sentai Power Ranger comparisons a little bit, but I, I thought it looked fine. I thought it was true enough to the comic book without like ripping off the Tony Stark in the MCU suits as much. Mm. Um, but then they take it away from her at the end, and that again just leads to the fact of well then why did we need her in the movie like i've seen behind the scenes stuff of her show and she's making her own suit so if if she doesn't get her suit from wakanda and again why did we need her in the film you know like she could have just had her own show which i am looking forward to yeah this doesn't make me more excited for that show other than the fact that i like the actress but i just was like well okay why I didn't need her in the film i, I I, 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 I would, yeah, I, I wish I could say like, no, this is why you need her in the film, but you're kind of right. Like there is like, I'm trying to, I'm having trouble coming up with a reason that she needs to be there. Like, I guess when, when Shuri gets kidnapped, like she needs to go with her, but it could have been anyone. Um, Mm -hmm. like, I don't know if maybe that, if we're going to get an answer to why she was in here. Like if something in this sets up what happens in Ironheart, um, sure, quite possibly. But yeah, I, 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 um, I I'm drawing a blank. What was uh, so? What's the name of the of the guard of the female guard that Okoye was the general for? Oh, you're asking me questions. The um, Dorma Malaje or something Dor- like Dorma that. Dorma Mar- Malaje, yeah. Something like that. I just. In the first Black Panther, you had Black Panther in the suit, and then you had the guard, and they just looked so badass in their mm-hmm. red, and they it was just a visual like it just looked cool. And then and then they didn't change, they didn't mech up for their big war in in Infinity War. They wore their shit, and yeah, they had some tech stuff, but it wasn't overpowering. So with this film. When they're like, let's get rid of that and put them in a mech suit, I was like, it doesn't look as cool as the as the original aesthetic of their red guard uniform. And I and I get it, Kokoya wasn't the general of that anymore. But I was like, uh, you know, if I had to choose between the two, I'd go with the original, not the mech version. And it just felt like, oh, but we want to sell more toys, and so we need to create these other suits. Uh, but in, in comparison, though, the outfits for the Talacan people, um, they look great. Their their whole setup and their mechanics for breathing while on the surface, mm-hmm. I thought that looked great. I thought they were they were looking really cool. I liked everything that we saw from them. I like their costumes. I like their their um their their city. I thought that all looked phenomenal, and mm-hmm. I like the fact that they rode around on whales. The one thing I am disappointed in that I did not get to see that I thought I was going to get to see was Umbaku punching an orca. Like I wanted to see that <laughs> so bad. He, he, get, he gets to see one. Up he gets front. to see yeah. one. I, I I thought that was set up. Of, okay. We're going to see Umbaku punch a whale. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I liked their weapons too. Those water grenades were really mm-hmm. cool. I remember in the trailer when the throne room gets immersed in water, I'm like, okay, but the throne room isn't near the ocean, so how are they going to get water up there? And then they do it with these grenades, these really cool, you know, bursts of water that do, like, you felt the destruction of that and the possibilities of how that could really, 
you know, mess somebody up. And so I did like that a lot. And their opening sequence against that uh, research station, um, that was that was creepy. Like it was in the nighttime. It had the right score. The mm -mm. sirens were luring people to their death. I was like, this is okay. This is a great introduction. I like yeah. it. Yeah. And I like that there's like confusion on like the Americans side of things. Like Wakanda probably did this, but like, no, it wasn't Wakanda. Like I, I like that they're setting up this conflict of, we think Wakanda is responsible for this, for that. They're going to probably explore it down the line. Like, mm -hmm. because it, it's still not known that Namor and his people are around. Like, Ross knows, but uh, his ex-wife uh, Val, she's not going to do anything about it. Like she, she's all for setting up the Wakandans. Yeah, yeah, I did like that politics of it. I did like the um, the the whole UN scene where they're like, "You promised you'd share your technology with us," and Wakanda was like, uh, "Yeah, we're just not going to give you." a weapon of mass destruction because knowing you, you would use it for that. <laughs> she, yeah. I mean, she looks straight at the U S and says, we know what you would do. <laughs> like we're not dumb. And, and then, uh, you know, bringing in the French seal team. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of a reverse. Um, uh, what was that? Um, there was a lot of old, I don't know if it was a Rambo film or, a or, a um a chuck norris film but it was, it was about pow's and they literally bring the pow's into the un at the end of the film they're like they exist and it was like the reverse of that like the seal team did exist and here's your people we're gonna bring them right here and right now yeah. and i like that scene it was cool no i really like that scene too um angela bassett did a great job in this um yeah there's been some talk of her getting the first mcu oscar acting nomination would you agree um, with that? I agree that she's a powerful actress. I don't believe she... Um, I, I feel like she should have had more. Somebody else mentioned this as well, that like her most powerful lines were in the trailer. And I kind of agree with that. Like That scene um, was... Although that whole scene was chilling. Like I felt for Okoye, because I was like, I would not want to be on the opposite side of that face. Like She... She at first I was like, um, you're being a little hard on Okoye, you know. She got mm -hmm. out, she got out uh, beat by like a, a bunch of people, but then she just starts listing off the things that Okoye has done and how she blames Okoye for them. And then that that one line about like you could go see your traitorous husband in prison. Mine's dead. And I was like, oh my gosh, it was yeah. like it was a really good scene. I wanted more. Uh, and I felt like the, the trailers kind of spoiled that, that scene. But yeah, she's a compelling actress, and I don't see why she couldn't be nominated. I, I know, uh, I'm not sure what would win, what would beat her out, but she definitely filled that role. Like, I don't feel anybody was half-assing it in this movie, and especially not her. No, I think everyone brought their A-game. Um, for sure. Um... I had a, I had a question. I can't remember what it was. Um, anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> well, as I draw a blank. <laughs> um, well, like I said, the technical stuff, I had some technical issues. We talked about the underwater people not really looking like they exist underwater. I did feel, I don't know what the technical term is it or it is, and maybe you would know it, but I felt like a lot of the film, the, the outside of the frame was super blurred and the inside was super sharp like it was like almost like a, a blurry vignette or something yeah that's like like a vignette yeah vignette that's um, what i was thinking yeah it, well this film was shot in anamorphic so it's a pan panavision film it's actually the 11th film to film in panavision anamorphic um i don't know enough about that to know what you're talking about it, anamorphic kind of the lens kind of warps the image a little bit and you get that effect more um 
with modern lenses, you see it like you do in this. With older lenses, you get this, the effect that you have in the Batman, where there's like mm. that little bit in focus, and then everything else is out of focus. Mm. Um, so I think that's a little bit of what you were seeing. Um, I thought it was overdone at points. Like I could, I, it was taking me out of the film because I was like struggling to see certain things. Yeah, and then I did feel, which is weird because it's directed by the same guy as the first one. I thought action sequences in the first Black Panther were fantastic. Even the CGI one-on-one battle at the end between Killmonger and, and, and Black Panther, yeah, it was CGI and they looked like rubber people, but I could see everything that was going on. Um, the, the 1v1 fight at the end of Wakanda Forever was a great fight, but there was a lot of action scenes before that that I was struggling to tell what was happening just because of the constant cuts and the super yeah. zoomed in on the action. I can't stand that. I And I always pick the same seats in the theater. I don't like sitting too close. I don't like sitting too far back. I get the same seats every time. So, you know, it's not like, oh, I was just too close to the screen this time and I, I needed to step back. I, I think this film's a... Like, compared to the first Black Panther, I think action-wise, the, the sequences were, for the most part, a lot better. I think with the, the chaos of the, the water and the boat scene at the end that was a bit hard to follow. And, but I think like the scenes in Wakanda, when they're under attack by um, Namor with all the water bombs, I thought that was very well done. And a, a lot of practical stuff with that water too. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's really hard to do CGI water effects when you're on a practical set like that. I think they did a really good job of doing James it. James Cameron pra- says, hold my beer. Here we yeah. go. Yeah. Avatar 2, coming next month to a cinema near you. Um, yeah. But... but I did really like that 1v1 fight at the end. Her versus... Uh, because a lot of people, I think, including myself, was like, all right, it, even if Shuri is the Black Panther, you know, we haven't even seen a montage of her throwing a, 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 a punch or, or training at all. So yeah. is she really going to be Black Panther? And she does get her ass kicked. Like, she only wins that fight because she she introduced tech to assist. You know, she they, they kind of, they had this working theory that if we, uh, if we uh, dehydrate uh, Namor and, you know, get some dehumidifiers in the, in the, uh, in the ship and, and then take him to a desert, like, that might bring him down a peg or two. And then she had she had incorporated like her blasters from the first film into her co- mm-hmm. into her Black Panther setup, and then she rigged the ship to blow. Uh, and I thought all of that like assisted in in her getting her ass kicked less. And so that was I did like that fight, um, and I I thought that was cool. Um, and then of course you know the vengeance will not consume me, and and we just let go of that a little quickly, but. Um, the aftermath of that with with Namor's folks being like, why? We literally had beat their army. We had them on the edge of the ship, and then you come in and say, back off, we're done. Why did you bend the knee to these people? We won. And, you know, he was like, well, we kind of still won because nobody knows about us, and they're going to need us. Like, they're the, the fight is inevitably coming to Wakanda, and they're going to need us. And we'll have the upper hand there. And I did like that kind of resolution, but leaving it open for the future at the end of the film. Yeah, I'm very curious to see what they do with the the story arcs that were kind of left hanging at the end of this. Mm -hmm. Because Wakanda's in kind of a weird place in the MCU right now. Like, it's kind of on everyone's radar. And... I'm curious when we'll explore this next, but all of the suits of armor in this make me wonder if this is going to be part of Armor War, Armor Wars. Armor Wars. Yeah, it's kind of hard to not think about that, right? Um, I also want to see what Wakanda's relationship with the world is like with King M'Baku, because he doesn't come across as diplomatic to me as his predecessors were. I think... I feel like there is a conversation that we miss between him and Shuri where, where she tells him he, she's not going to go to that ceremony that he's going to be respectful of 
what was done before him. I can I can see him going either way, like either keeping what T'Challa and his family had started with embracing the outside world a bit, but holding back the vibranium. But I could also see him be like, you know what? No, we're not going to do that. Um, but I was kind of surprised that by that ending with him where he's taking the, the throne. Mm-hmm. Without the herb. Without the herb. Be- well, be- and, and my wife pointed this out to me because she's like, well, in Civil War, T'Challa wasn't king, but he was still the Black Panther. Like, you don't have to be king and Black Panther at the same time. I was like, that's fair. He wasn't? His 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 dad he was the Black Panther before his dad died. In Civil War. Sure. Okay. Well yeah, but his dad was king. He was and king. Then as yeah. soon as as soon as his dad died, they they then did the king ceremony. So yes. Okay, okay. Well you well, oh sure, I get what you're saying, but then so now we have a king who's not Black Panther, but we also have a Wakanda without a Black Panther because uh Shuri decides to go off with uh with what's her name uh and and, and Nakia. live in Haiti. Nakia, she decides to go to Haiti in, instead of stay in Wakanda. I I that looked d- like a slightly permanent choice or at least for a while. I I think it's temporary. I think and there's nothing to say Mbaku doesn't take the heart-shaped herb. Maybe they're, they maybe they will have two Black Panthers if if mm. she's gone. Uh, I think that that's open to interpretation and we'll probably get answers to that in Black Panther 3. Um, I want to talk a bit about the Haiti stuff at the end because we, we, we've been skirting around it for a bit. Um, yeah. There is a mid credit scene here with um, Shuri and Nakia and the reveal of Prince T'Challa son of King T'Challa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, from the moment Angela Bassett said, I need, there's something you need to know about your brother. I was like, okay, well, what, what's, now, what what's that this, be? what's the secret? And when she goes to the astral plane, it's like, okay, this is where she's going to get that reveal. And then it's kill yeah. I was like, Oh wait. And so like at, at the end of the movie, I was like, so what was the secret? Like, are we going to find that out in this one or, is that gonna? Because I I like full on expected the mid credit scene to be Riri Williams going back to her garage and having her suit be there, like straight up post credit scene from Civil War with Spider Man getting sure. his. Sure. But and a lot of other people thought for some reason that Doom was gonna show up. There was this whole fake campaign on YouTube where people were like, "We've seen the mid credit scene and it's Doom," and I was like, "I don't believe you." No, <laughs> it wasn't. Um. <laughs> I really like that they talk about T'Challa having a son. Like I, I like that reveal. I think it was very well done and I didn't see it coming until the, the credits started rolling. I was like, I bet that's what's going on. I bet that's what mm. happens. Yeah. I really liked that as well. I did not see it coming, but it was, it was, um, Again, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, there was a lot of people saying, some people were like, you need to recast him. This is, if you would, you know, what if Steve Rogers, Chris Evans had died after Captain America 1? What if Robert Downey Jr. had died after Iron Man 1? Would you really derail the entire MCU by not continuing that character? And a lot of people kind of thought it was unfair that they would do that to T'Challa because there's not a lot of black uh, primary superheroes in the yeah. MCU right now, and and we need everyone we can get. And T'Challa is a si- significant character to just wipe the world, the MCU world of T'Challa, just like that. So I totally understood why people wanted him recast. I think that would have still been a hard thing. We're not talking about Rhodey. You know, a lot of people forget, honestly, that there was a previous Rhodey uh uh you know before iron man 2 uh and and or even you know, bruce banner not... correct but it's not it's not the same but yeah. i did think this was a brilliant way of saying we're not done with t'challa we're keeping his namesake in this and also we believe we're gonna be around 
or uh, either we're going to be around long enough for a character like this to naturally become Black Panther, or we're going to see some time jumps in the near future where we do get a younger, maybe a, a young Avengers uh, Black Panther. Obviously not right now because this would be like pre-K Avengers, uh, if you know, with some of these with with Love and some of these other young kids. But I did really like that. I I was like, this is heartfelt and this yeah. is smart. And it, and it worked for the character that he would want this kid raised outside of Wakanda. That made so much sense based on Black Panther 1. Yeah, because and the, there are so many moments in this just watching like comparison videos of people talking about this movie, movie so far. Like there's the moment from the astral plane with his father in the first film where he says a, a parent who does not prepare their child for their, their death has failed as a as a parent and then mm. they talk about chichala ha- prepared us for his death and it's like oh okay yeah. and then there's another moment with mbaku and shuri where he says um with everything you've gone through it it would no one can any no one can call you a child anymore it, mm. but like in the first one he calls her out on the waterfall as a child just playing with her technology like there, there are so many subtle callbacks that real are really powerful when you go back and compare the two films. Like it really does expand these characters and take what they learn from that first, like their experiences from that first film and this film, and they, they you can see the growth in all of them. And I think that's yeah. something that it's kind of rare in the MCU because a lot of sometimes the characters just kind of reset. Like you go from yeah. Iron Man three where Tony Stark gives up all of his suits and then you're in Age of Ultron and he has all of the suits again, uh, so. Yeah, I I just I I just go back to saying I don't believe that um, that the Queen needed to die. I I think she could have been very hardly or she could have been very badly injured mm-hmm. and in recovery and this would have been the thing because you don't you know. Again, like I said, this film encaps it with we got at the beginning the T'Challa stuff and we get at the end T'Challa stuff. But she's mourning for T'Challa at the end. We don't really see her mourn for the death of her mother, you know, like that's yeah. just kind of glossed over. And which and, and and this is why I feel like she didn't need to die. Like there was already enough for Shuri to build on, and we could have focused on that a little more to build this rage up inside her. I I just thought that yeah. like. I didn't think that was necessary for the character. And I'm kind of sad that Angela Bassett is gone because she was such a strong point. And I I wonder if part, and I hate to say this, but I wonder if part of the, like part of the reason Riri Williams is in this is because that death of the queen of Wakanda sacrificing herself to save Riri is what drives her beyond the events of this movie to be a hero. Maybe, 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 but that's, like, a, that's a weak reason. That's it such is. A, a, um, such a but weak we'll see. reason to kill off Angela Bassett. <laughs> yeah, we'll, I mean, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, I mean, the, but the, I did, the, the end of this film with, with Shuri going to Haiti, first of all, I love the whole incorporation of Haiti and how they, you know, we did, we can't have an Atlantis. So this is kind of the origin of Talacan and everything. I, yeah, oh, yeah. I liked all of that. That was smart writing the colonization of Haiti and that incorporating it into the backstory of Namor. I loved all of that. I thought that was really smart writing on Kugler's part, but Shuri going to Haiti at the end, it leaves the door open, but it also gives us a reason why we might not see black Panther for a while, because there were rumors that Shuri said, I'm doing this film and then I'm done after the back and forth experience and the off screen stuff with her and the anti vax stuff and everything. There were rumors for a while that said she wanted out after this film. Granted, that was a while ago, and she has been pushing this film in pressers and everything like that, which is not normally what somebody would do if they want out. So maybe she's changed her mind. But it kind of leaves the door open for will we see her again or is this a natural exit in the writing? Uh, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens, and I'm sure we'll find out sooner rather than later. Um, you think? Yeah, because they're gonna start putting 
the cast together for the Avengers movies that are coming out in two but in three years. So we'll know it we'll know seems so far off to me plot wise. Like they, they I feel like there's a lot of groundwork to get there, you know? Yeah, I mean you figure this this year we had a Marvel project every month. You keep that going oh. for the next two years. It is a long way off, but it's true. Can, can you true. believe this is the thirtieth film in the MCU? Bizarre. It's so bizarre to me. Yeah. And then when you think about the shows on top of that, there's so much going for this universe. Like, yeah, I mean, Disney, Disney has gone all in on Marvel and it is, it is astounding. It is honestly astounding. I, you can't think of any other franchise that's ever achieved this greatness. Like a star Wars is a close second, but even still it doesn't have as much as, as Marvel does. It's, I would... it's, it's insane. I would say there's more Star Trek than there is Star Wars, even at this point. Eh, maybe, like you, you maybe. look at. I mean, when you start thinking about the animated properties, then the Star Wars stuff Star kind of kind of catches know, a lot up. of animated stuff. But know. even then, like that's like five series compared to Star Trek's ten that have all yeah. gone from multiple. Most of them gone for multiple seasons, uh, plus yeah. all plus all of the movies, like. Mm-hmm. I I I would love to see like a the math of what has more content between Marvel, Star Wars, Star Trek. Um, and think about the think about the Star Trek and how long ago that started and Star Wars goes all the way back to the 70s and when the MCU goes back what 12 years at this point, yeah. 13 years at this point, 12. it's insane. Like it's that's a lot in 14, 12 14 years. years. Yeah. 14 years. I was going to say that's 12 sounds a little young, but yeah. still 14 years to cover that much ground. It is insane. And that's a huge investment and it's paid off. And yeah, you have some duds in there, but the good far out, out shines and overwhelms the bad. And I it, think it's impressive. And even the duds, I think there are redeeming qualities for it. Like, sure. Say what you want about Thor, uh, the dark world. But I think the, the, the Thor theme in that is probably the best Thor musical score that we've gotten. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, but... and then you, you have your Iron Man 3 and you or, 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 uh, or your Black Widow or we're, some other stuff. We're not here to slander uh, on Iron Man 3. Uh, <laughs> I will not I did, have that. You know, me and you were talking earlier that maybe we should have a show uh, before the end of this year where we talk about um, maybe we rank all of Phase Four, maybe we expand it to just ranking the MCU. I think that's a massive project. Well, though. I would like to see the ranking of at least Phase Four and, and talk about that now I, that it's all wrapped up. Yeah, I think that's definitely something we need to do, um, and I think I know the perfect time that we can do that because let me get rid of this here. We have one more Marvel project coming up this year, and that's the that's right. Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. So that's mm-hmm. the the epilogue to, I believe James Gunn called it, to Phase 4. So I think that would be a good time uh, to talk about Phase 4 and rank the films. I plan on going back and rewatching Phase 4, uh, all of the films, because I think I've seen most of them once. With the, the exception... Yeah, I think the only one that I've seen more than once was Spider-Man No Way Home, for obvious mm-hmm. reasons. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think I think that would be a good time to rank the films, and maybe like I, I want to keep the films and the shows separate in ranking. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we'll, we'll talk about it. But I think I think, there, talk about it. I think there's some exciting things coming up for us as Marvel correspondents next year mm-hmm. um, that we need to talk about at some point off of the off of the podcast. So stay tuned for that. Um, I just I just want to uh, 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 close this out. I I want to say how incredibly um, uh, in, well just in awe I am about the status of comic book films in Hollywood in 2022 when yeah. I grew up when I grew up things like Blade things like uh, X-Men you know the first X-Men those were outliers Spider-Man those were risks that studios would take 
and you're like, oh my god, they're taking it seriously. You know, they're they're trying to put out a really good comic book film. It's insane. And looking back over the last year, we had we had one. Let's see, we had uh, Thor: Love and Thunder. I'm not doing it in order. We had Thor: Love and Thunder. We had Doctorverse: Multiverse of Madness. We had Morbius. We had Wakanda Forever. We had Black Adam. We had uh, the Batman. We had Super Pets. Uh, and then we had off-brand uh, 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 superhero uh, movies in The Samaritan and Secret Headquarters. That's a lot of comic book films in one year. Yeah. It dominates. E- even if they're not all gems, they're dominating the movie releases. And that's an it's incredible year for me, someone like me who's obsessed with comics to live in. And I really love it. Yeah, and I think next year is going to be even more stacked just on the film side of things because you've got mm. Ant Man in the Lost Quantumania, Shazam, mm. Fury of the Gods, God, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, Spider Man Across the Spider Verse, The Flash, The Marvels, Blue Beetle, Craven the Hunter, Aquaman in the Lost Kingdom. Like, there's it's like insane. that's just the movies. Plus, you have all of the D, all, all of the Marvel and DC shows. Um, yeah. Because I'm not sure when wow. season two of Peacemaker is coming, but you've also mm-hmm. got Secret Invasion and mm-hmm. Loki's got coming the Mor- back. The, what if the Morbius, the 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 Morbius TV show? Uh, it's called Morbin Time. The show It's going to be uh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. I, see. If that happens, if, if that happens next year with the 30th anniversary of Power Rangers, Sabad will sue. Uh, Hasbro will sue. Um, like it was funny, but not now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like we're we're actually trying to do an anniversary thing over here. Like s- stop cr- cr- trying to crowd in on our thing. Yeah, but I like it. I like it. Uh, yeah, I think that does it for our Wakanda Forever review. Uh, Josh, mm-hmm. where can people find you? People can find me. Uh, fiercelit dot com, fierceliterature dot com. I got some shows coming up in early twenty twenty three. But uh, nothing on the radar currently. Uh, I'm on all the social things, at least until I have to start paying for them. Hint, hint, Elon Musk. I'm not planning on doing that. Uh, So other than that, um, you can find me out there. I'm around. What about you? Uh, People can find me on the Victims Victims and Villains Patreon podcast, uh, Hope After Dark, Mm -hmm. where we talk about Mm -hmm. uh, B-rated movies that you may not have known about. The one for November is going to be very interesting and is a Casper ripoff. Uh, so hit ch- head over to patreon.com to see that. Uh, you can also find me on my podcast. Uh, you have to watch this podcast where me and my two co-hosts make each other watch movies. One of us has never seen before. We just did the weird Al weird, the Al Yankovic story and had a lot of fun mm. trying out That's weird cool. foods from Britain that Devin brought over. It's coming um, up. What's what's your next? Uh, our next film? one is I'm ha- I am actually going to stop recording this, send it over to Josh, and go watch the movie Top Gun Maverick, uh, which is my pick oh, for the guys oh, yeah. this week. Oh yeah, that's right. So very nice. I can't wait to hear that. I love that film. Yeah, I did too. So I'm really excited to see the guys watch it. Devin actually watched it on the plane ride home to the UK. So I'm he had like a 4D experience. Yeah, movie about so, planes on a plane. I like yeah. it. But, well, yeah. and while it's not Marvel related, I think we should encourage people to come back on Tuesday uh, for Victims and Villains, where me and you and a couple other folks will be talking about the great Kevin Conroy, who uh, signature in the DC universe and the voice of Batman, and sadly passed away mm-hmm. uh, this past week. And so we're going to do a little tribute show to them and. Uh, uh, I encourage everybody to come out and watch that show. Yes, and that will be live on the Victims and Villains YouTube channel. So if you're watching us live on yes. Twitch, we will be taking that over to the YouTube channel this week because we want to try out some different platforms. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So make sure to subscribe to Victims and Villains there. If you're watching us here on Twitch, go ahead and hit that follow button. Like Victim and Villains on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram and visit victimsandvillains.net for more movie reviews, podcasts, and and most importantly, mental health resources. If you or someone you love is struggling, uh, we have plenty of resources there to help you or help, help you help them, uh, because you matter 
And that's what we're at the end of the day. That's what this is all about. So until next time, until I guess the end of the month when we do the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special uh, for victims and villains, I'm Alan. And I'm Josh. Thanks for joining us, folks. Wakanda forever.